verse number 26 says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, this is an advantage that we have when we have the Spirit of God. We see that Jesus is telling us who the Comforter is. The Comforter is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, whom the Father will send in his name. And he says he will do what? He will teach you all things. So everything that has to do with God, it has to be taught by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is our teacher. You say, but what about when there are teachers that stand before us? What about prophets and all this? You will hear the Spirit of God speaking through other people. So, yes, his voice is what you will hear, and you will know the voice of God. In other words, you will know his prompting. You will know his direction, because if you get to know him, you will understand when he's speaking through somebody else. The anointing is there. So the Holy Ghost is our teacher, and he teaches us everything that we can know from the word of God. It also mentions that he will also bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So in other words, Jesus has already said some things. They have been recorded in the Bible. And so when you have read the Bible and you have read those words, they will come back to you and in various times in your life. You don't necessarily have to be reading it at that time, but if it's already in you, he will recall it to you when you need it. Amen? Amen? So he will remind you of what the word of God says. The devil is not reminding you of what the Bible says. You know, the devil will use scripture sometimes to twist scripture, but he don't want you to really know what he said. He don't want you to know what the Lord has said. So you can't say, well, that's, that's the devil talking to me when it's the word of God talking to you. You will know it's God because you recognize that spirit. Amen? Amen. And then we find in John chapter 15, verse number 26, Jesus also says, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds from the father, he shall testify of me. Well, we're seeing the comforter being the Holy Ghost. He is going to teach us what we need to know. He is going to, he's, he's, he's going to bring to our remembrance the things that the Lord has already said. And now we're seeing that he's going to testify of the Lord. Now, these are things that we can see that gives us an advantage over people in the world. Because people in the world may have good personalities. They may have some good character. They may be good, pleasant people. But that doesn't mean that they're saved. But when we have the Spirit of God living in us, He's the one that's teaching us the word of God. He's the one that helps us. The word comforter actually means to help you, to come alongside. Amen. He, he gives us confidence in the Lord. Then we also find that he will bring to our remembrance what the Lord has said. He recalls the word of God to us. And finally, he says that he will testify of Jesus Christ. No other spirit. He's the one that testifies from within us. So when you are speaking, when you are living, your life ought to be a testimony of what the Lord is doing. You draw attention to the Lord. Amen. See, you can be a good person. You can be a person who has a pleasant personality. But you still may not give credit to the Lord. But if you are born again, and you know where that's coming from, then you will give credit to the Lord and people will have their attention drawn to him and say, I know that's not you. I know that's the Lord Jesus in you. I understand. I recognize his spirit in you. And so when you are living your life, you'll be able to say, I know that it's not me because I was a whoremonger. I was a thief. I was a liar. I was dishonest. I was this way, I was that way, and if it had not been for the Lord coming into my life and giving me a change in my life, then I would still be out there. I would still be like that, but I'm not like that anymore because my heart has been changed. I have a new love now. 
I'm connected with the Lord, the creator of the universe. I'm the one who I am created to be in his image. And that's what it is about. I'm being molded and shaped in his image. So that's the difference in a person who has the spirit of God in them and the person who might be just a pleasant person that's living out in the world who's not saved. We give him credit for the life that we live. The Spirit of God does not make or force you to do right. It's important to know that even when you are born again, the Spirit of God does not force you or make you do right. It's not an automatic thing. You still have a choice to make. You still have decisions you can make. You can still choose. That's why the word says, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Choose the one that you're going to, to, to serve because the Bible lets us know that whoever we yield our members to, that's who we're the slave of. Who are we going to yield our members to? Now he was talking to Christians when he said that. That was Paul that said that whoever you yield your members to. So if you are saved, then you have, you have a choice to make. Do you want to obey the spirit of the Lord that's in you? Or do you want to give in to the appetites of the flesh? If you have the spirit of the Lord in you, you ought to desire to obey him and to, and to yield to him. But if you still have all the appetites of the flesh that you want to yield to and that's all you want to do, Chances are you're probably not even born again. But you will have the appetites of the flesh either way, but that doesn't mean that you got to give in to it all the time. The Spirit of God does not make you or force you do any, to do anything. If he, if he can make you and force you to do everything or to do uh, good, there wouldn't be any need for Paul and John and Peter to write in these epistles. We wouldn't have any epistles because the epistles are written to the church so that the church can understand how to line up with the word of God, how to line up with scripture, how to get the life right. So even if you are saved and you, you can still be living some raggedy lives and defeated lives, oh, you can go to heaven, but he wants you to be able to be earthly good. <laughs> in other words, he wants to be able to use you here on this earth and so that you can represent Jesus Christ in the earth. That's why you're still here. He could have taken you on to heaven at the moment you got born again. But that's not why he got you here. He's got you here to serve for a period of time so that you can represent him right here on this earth. So the epistles were not necessary if he was going to force you and make you do right. The next thing is important to know. The spirit of God is truly our helper. When we know that he's not going to make us do anything. That means that we have to do something or make efforts ourselves and then he comes along to help us. He don't do it all by himself, but he wants you to make an effort to do what you know is right and obedient to God. And when you make the effort, he comes along to help you. That's the reason why the word says what he does is he's our teacher. He reminds us of the truth. And he endues us with power. That means he gives us the ability. He gives us power. He gives us the authority. And he gives us the ability to operate by his spirit. But we have to do the work. What is the work? Well, it's work to read the Bible. It's work to pray. It's work even to listen to a preacher. It's work to act in obedience to the word of God. The Spirit of God is going to give us information. He's going to give us instruction, but it's up to us to be obedient. He's not pushing you out there to make you do anything. But once again, he's going to give us information. He's going to give us instruction. And he's going to allow us or have given us the power to be obedient to the instruction that he gave us. We have to do it. Everybody say, I have to do it. That's why James says, faith without works is dead. Faith is in you, but if you don't work, faith can't operate. You have to stir up the faith so that you can let faith operate 
in you. Amen. So what you're doing is you are, you have to have some effort from yourself. Look at this. In other words, you know when people go to the gym to work out, many of y'all go to the gym, I think, and work out or something. I see heads, a few heads nod, no, some heads are shaking. Anyway, those of you who used to go to the gym, <laughs> notice that if you were ever working out with weights, you, you, you started working out with weights and you got stronger and stronger, didn't you? Why? Because it wasn't that the muscles were not in your body already. The muscles were there. But when you started picking up 50 pounds one week, the next week you added to that and maybe you started picking up 80 pounds. Why? Because the muscles you already had began to grow. And then the next week you might have moved on up to 100 pounds and on and on. You know, you get stronger and stronger because you're building the muscles that you already have. That's the same way it is with operating in faith. You have to do something, but then those muscles on the inside, they increase so that you will then be able to do more. Come on. Because now... You're growing in the knowledge of God. You're growing in, 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 in understanding because you begin to exercise what you already have. So when you start with what you got, that's when the Lord does more. And he's the one who moves you. Not just taking your hand and your feet and turning you into a robot. I'm talking about he moves you on the inside to direct you so that you can make your decision to what you're going to do. Are you going to obey him? I'm talking about when he moves us, it's a prompting. Everybody say a prompting. prompting. And we're steered from the inside. But see, what many people think is that they get saved and that the Holy Ghost is going to do everything for you. He's going to, he's going to turn you and treat you and act, you know, you start acting more like a robot, you know, saved. Okay, Spirit of God, move my arm, move my arm, move my other arm, move this arm, turn this way, go that way, walk, walk. I'm a robot. Yes, Lord, I do what you want me to do. Whatever you want me to do, Lord, I do it. Whatever you want me to say, Lord, I say. Whatever you want me to do. And so there we go. We look like robots walking around. Well, that's what we think that God wants us to do is that he's going to make every move in us, but it's not like that. No, it's you moving. Amen. You moving by obedience to the spirit of God that's in you. But yet, he gets the credit for it. He gets the credit for it. How many of you realize that there's, a, there, that there's the coach that sends the team out on the field? And when they win the championship, everybody's coming around the coach and interviewing the coach and saying, you did a great job, you won the championship. Coach didn't get out there on the field. It was the players that was out there on the field. The coach did the directing. The coach did the teaching. The coach did, gave the instruction. But the players went out and followed his instruction and they did the work. But it was through, his, through obeying the instruction of the coach. And so the coach gets the credit. Everybody say, you did a good job, coach. You, you, you won the championship. You did this and you did that. And he didn't actually do it. It was the players that were doing it. The Holy Ghost is our coach. And he coaches us from the inside. So there is more to faith than just talking it. The evidence that God is in you is when you bring forth the fruit. It's about bringing forth fruit. It's more than just talking it, but it's doing it and doing it by obedience to the spirit of God. God wants us to be productive in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. He wants us to be productive in the kingdom. So it's truly easy to do the talking, but when we start talking it and then doing it, see, that's a different thing. <laughs> because there are folks who want to take it easy. And church folks, they like to take it easy. Everybody else is going to do it. I'm just going to talk it. I'm going to talk big. Sound like I'm doing something. Sound like I'm, I'm a big giver. I don't give anything. Sound like I'm making efforts and to help out and, and to be a part of everything and to be a, a team player, but I'm really not. 
I'm just sitting back waiting for everybody else to do it, but I want to take credit for it. I want to, I want to, I want to everybody, you know, I want to get all of the benefits that everybody else gets. And that's the same thing that happens on, on the team. Some people, you know, they don't want to participate on the team. All the other players out there getting hit, moving and doing everything, but if you don't want to come to practice, you don't want to be a part of this, you don't want to, you don't want to do all of the things that it takes to, to, to get out there and, and work like everybody else. But when everybody else is being praised, and you out there, you know, jumping up, woo, we won. <laughs> we, you do nothing. <laughs> but just because you're a part of the team, you're saying, we won. Well, it would be a whole lot better if you actually participate. Amen? Amen? So when the Spirit of the Lord is working in us, what is he doing? He helps us to show compassion toward others. See, this is how you can prevent being a hypocrite. Because if you have compassion on others, that means that you look out for other people's benefit. You are trying to see how can you be a service to someone. A true hypocrite is somebody who hates to serve, who don't want to do anything, uh, but they still want to get the credit. But someone who is truly, truly operating by the Spirit of God is somebody who's operating in compassion. God wants us to have compassion on others. God wants us, number two, to serve people, and the church will provide opportunities for you to serve people. Many times, you know, we say, well, I don't, it's nothing I can do. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a lone person, so I, I, it's, I don't really do anything. You know, it's nothing for me to do. But usually, if you get involved in the things that the church is doing, the church will provide an opportunity for you to serve people. And that's what we like to do here, is to make sure that there are various opportunities, various things that you can do to get involved in so that you can serve other people. If you don't know how to serve people on your own, just get involved in what the church is doing. Amen? Number three, Jesus even tells us this. It's important that we work while it is day. That's what he said about himself. I'm going to do what I know I'm supposed to do while it is day. There are many distractions out here in the world. There are many things that would take our attention away. But to do the work of the kingdom while we have an opportunity, while we're young, while we're healthy, while we still have the activities of our limb, let's do something in the kingdom of God. Let's be productive in the things that we know is going to benefit and build up the kingdom of God and the people of God. Amen? Don't wait until you get old and decrepit and say, well, I guess now I'll start serving the Lord. No, no, we don't want to do that. Why? Because we want to give God our best years. Amen. We want to give him the best years. So matter, no matter how young you are, when you learn about who Jesus is and what he wants you to do in your life, and basically what he wants you to do is serve others and be a, be a blessing to other people, start where you are. You don't have to wait for a big ministry to come along. You don't have to wait for somebody to give you a certificate and say, okay, this is what you are. You don't have to go through a whole lot of training and all of that just so that you can get a title. All you need is just to start wherever you are. It may be one-on-one -on -one with somebody. It may be, you know, sitting across the, the cafeteria in the, you know, in the lunchroom. You're just talking to somebody and just somehow or other, you know, ask them if they know the Lord. You know, there are so many things that, God can have you to do at a young age. And many of us, I mean, everybody in here and everybody under the sound of my voice, you're young because you'll never be this young again. I don't care what your age is. If you're 80, 90 years old, you're still young. And whatever, if you're able to hear me, you can serve the Lord somewhere. Begin where you are. Amen. Amen. Ask God to put the right spirit in you. Your spirit must cooperate with the spirit of God. Problem with most people is, is that they have the wrong attitude, the wrong spirit. Say, well, I got the spirit of God. Yeah, I'm talking about little s spirit. In other words, your spirit may not be right. <laughs> your spirit, even though the spirit of God may be in you, you've got to learn how to cooperate with the spirit of God. So that way you can be in obedience to what God is doing and what God is saying and what God is moving on you to do. That way you will, you will get Connect it with him and you will know his voice and you will not be deceived. Come on now. 
if your spirit is wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up with Jesus, you would not be led wrong. So all you got to do is cooperate with him as he is leading you. I can't hear his voice. Yes, you can. Vo God's voice is not just a, a, a word going out over the airwaves. God's voice is sometimes circumstances. You can hear him speaking through you, to you through circumstances. You can hear him speaking to you through his word. You can hear him speaking to you through another person. I have so many ways, but you will recognize what God is saying to you as you in, just cause yourself to be in tune with him. We're about to wrap this up. Last one. When you put forth effort, then he does in you what you can't do. When you put forth effort toward the things of the kingdom of God and what you know is right, that's when he picks you up. And that's when he takes over that place that you cannot do. That's why we say if we do the natural thing, he's going to put his super on the natural and cause you to operate in supernatural. If you do the natural thing, if you're laying hands on somebody and praying for somebody, that's really natural because that's something that you can do. But the effects of it will be supernatural. Leave the super up to God. You do what you naturally can do, and he takes care of the rest. I gave this analysis not long ago about the eagle that feeds the little eaglets when they're very young and when they're small. But when they get to a certain stage, that eagle will push her little eaglets out of the nest. And because eagles usually make their nests up in high places, high trees, high mountains, that little eaglet is falling. And that eaglet is, going, is only going to do what comes natural, flap his wings. And he's doing all he knows to do because he don't like the feeling of falling. And none of us like that feeling of falling. None of us want to feel like we're failing. So we're reaching out for something. We, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me. But what does that eaglet do eventually? He learns that, hey, okay, now I'm doing with all of my effort. But when I lock my wings in place, something about how that the wind just comes underneath and picks him up and he begins to soar in the air without any effort at all. He's all, all he's doing is just locking his wings and saying, well, hey, this is all right. I can fly. I flapped and I did all of this because that's all I could do. But once I did what I could do, the wind took over from there. The wind of the Holy Spirit would take over. At the moment that when you start making your effort and you're flapping and you're saying, Lord, I need you, Lord, I need you, Lord, I need you. He said, lock them. Cool. And he'll Lord. pick you up you, and take you where he wants you to go. Because the Holy Spirit is like the wind that will take you in the areas where you ought to go. And as you are soaring in him and you learn how to do that more and more, you get better and better. You grow more and more. You get stronger and stronger. And you don't have to be called a hypocrite. No. Why? Because you're depending on him. You're, you're trusting in him. He's got me. <laughs> He's moving me. I'm just, I'm just locking my wings. I, all I can do now is lock my wings. But I made the effort at first, but now I know how to trust in the Lord. Glory to God. You remember that old song way back then you say, I will trust. In the Lord, I will trust in the Lord. Stand up. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will. Come on, just lift your hands as you sing this song. Yeah. Glory to God. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I... See, that's the difference in somebody who knows the Lord and somebody who doesn't. People who know God know how to put their trust in him, know how to lean on him and depend on him. 
and therefore we can live our lives basically effortless and you say well wait a minute effortless yeah you put forth your effort mm. you do what you need to do to work in the kingdom of God to serve others to be a help and then after a while you begin to realize that it's no longer I but Christ that lives in me my helper has come my helper is steered up my helper is giving me the strength and the instruction and the peace and it's a peace that passes all understanding don't you want that today if you want to live a life mm. that is pleasing to God but also a life where you know that you don't have to just depend on man's ways but you know that you can trust in the Lord and God will actually live through you love through you work through you you're doing it with your natural hands but he's instructing you from the inside. Walking and living in obedience to the Lord. This is the life of faith that is pleasing to him. Just pray with me. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, those who are listening and watching today, I pray that you would just touch someone today. Let them understand, Father, that they don't have to be afraid of being a hypocrite. They don't have to be afraid of making an effort toward you because they think they're gonna fail. But let them know, Father, that, that you won't let anyone fail if they reach out to you. Mm. Lord, if anyone would be in Christ, he would be a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become brand new in you. And Lord, you let us know that if we come to you, you will in no wise cast us out. All we have to do is make that effort to come toward you today in the name of Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Accept Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior and invite him to live his life through you and to show you the way. And he will. There is no way that God is going to turn you down if you truly want to be a part of his family. Mm. Amen. Amen. If you love the Lord, what we want you to do, give us a call. Come by and visit with us at 3402 Doris Circle. We're here in Montgomery, Alabama. We want to see you face to face and we want you to come and be ministered to and to be a part of the move of God and what God is doing right here in this congregation. We would love to have you to come and visit with us. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for joining us for Day of Deliverance. Come on, give a little.